Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's panel. This is the Full Sail University Women in Tech panel. Thank you so much for joining us. We are going to explore really some exciting careers from one of our several of our Full Sail graduates and really excited to talk to you today. Certainly as the moment in time that we're in right now, technology has become at the forefront of how we're continuing to communicate and move things forward. So it's an absolute pleasure to host our guests today. I'm Sheena Fowler. I am the Vice President of Innovation at the Orlando Economic Partnership and a proud Full Sail graduate and part of the Hall of Fame. I'm gonna introduce my panelists here today and give them a moment to say hello. I'm gonna go through everybody's names and then I'll call it you one at a time to give just a one or two sentence introduction. Let's start with Andrea. She is the marketing manager at Google. Welcome. We've got Erin Ebhart, lead project manager at Blizzard. Got Laika Segura, the cloud infrastructure architect at Amazon Web Services, and Karis Fraser Baker, who is a technical artist at Walter P. Moore. Welcome everybody. So let's start with you, Andrea. You wanna give us just the 30 second rundown of what you do? Sure, uh, thanks for having me. My name is Andrea. I work in Google Cloud, Google Cloud for Education. So my job is to help faculty members uh, and other students utilize cloud technology in the classroom. Awesome, thank you. Erin, how about you? Uh, I am a lead project manager on eSports at Blizzard Entertainment. Uh, we help oversee all the program planning uh, and rollout of all of our live events, uh, though of course this year has been a little bit different for us, so our online broadcasts uh, for Hearthstone, World of Warcraft, and classic StarCraft and Warcraft for eSports. Oh, fantastic. Laika. Yes, hi, I, I'm Laika. I work as a cloud infrastructure architect for Amazon Web Services. It's just a fancy word for consultant. I help um, enterprises move to the cloud or help them re-architect their platform to fit the cloud model. Yeah. Fantastic. And Karis? Hey, guys. Uh, I am a technical artist, which means that I'm a, technically an artist, um, but I'm an artist slash programmer. I work on virtual reality for Walter P. Moore, which is a structural engineering firm. Um, we have offices all over the world, but mine is in downtown Orlando. And uh, we work on um, large entertainment projects. Uh, we work on um, skyscrapers and parking garages and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, uh, any kind of sports stadium you can imagine. So um, yeah, uh, it's cool, cool working in VR. Fantastic. So as you can see, we've got a great group of women here who work in a variety of different aspects of technology. And one thing that we all have in common is that we are females that graduated from Full Sail University. Tech and media and everything that we go to has predominantly been a male dominated industry for decades, but you know what? We are changing those times. And now is an amazing time if you're considering a career in technology. I want to let these women shed some insight on what they've been able to do with their careers and how Full Sail really empowered them to move it forward. So let's jump in with the first question. I really want to understand, um, and we'll go one by one, how has technology changed uh, since you graduated and got into the field to today? And if you could really focus on the insight of, you know, the pace of change and being able to adapt to it, um, I think that would be a great thing for, for our audience to hear today. So Andrea, let's start with you. All right, sure. Um, I work in marketing, specifically digital marketing. So things have changed quite a bit. <laughs> um, when I first started in marketing, we had these larger budgets and it was all about brand awareness and um, now I would say my field is extremely data driven, you know, I'm building data warehouses, I work in SQL, like every dollar spent has to have some type of ROI that we can measure, and we won't even launch a campaign that doesn't have measurable results. So I think that's been the biggest shift for me by far. Great. And Laika, what have you seen shift since you first got into this? Um, I would say more and more women are joining the tech industry. When I started with my previous job, there's only like, I would say four of us out of the hundred people on the floor. 
But um, as more months go on, a lot of other women join too. And when I moved to Amazon, there's I've been exposed to more women and um, a little bit more of equality between the, the genders working in the tech industry. Erin, what about you? Yeah, so for me, I've um, I've changed uh, my kind of focus in my industry uh, several times now. So I'm still in games. I've been in games, but I've moved from development uh, to kind of front end uh, product work to now esports and live events. And so um, I think you know, obviously, the technology is changing all the time. Um, but as a project manager, being able to keep up with the different products and the different paces of each project has been really, uh, really awesome for me. I want to echo what, like I said too, is uh, you know, with more and more women join the industry all the time. I think esports is an incredibly friendly uh, space for women, uh, which has been really awesome. I found a lot of other like-minded women uh, who are running teams, who are out there making these massive events happening. Uh, so it's been it's been really cool to see that growth. Great, Karis. What's really unique about being an emerging technology in particular is that while it's been around for more than a decade, you know, it was very uh, prevalent in the the '90s. Um, you know, we're now seeing the consumer resurgence of the virtual reality and the augmented reality. Um, and I think that it, it, it's crazy to think back to 2013 year old game, uh, 2013 uh, year graduate game art student, Karis, uh, trying to imagine this industry that she didn't even know existed. So like back then, I didn't know this industry was a, a possibility, much less what it is now. Um, so uh, it's a really unique opportunity to be able to work with this technology, to have to do the research and development on it, and uh, you know get the the privilege of of seeing the um, how much it and how quickly it evolves and changes over the past few years. Um, it's been really fun and a challenge, and you have to constantly be learning. And honestly, that's what I really enjoy about it and what keeps me engaged in it. So, Karis, you bring up a really great point. It when you graduated, you didn't even know the field that you would be working in today. So now let's take a, a moment to imagine five, 10 years forward from where you are today. What do you see changing with VR and XR? And, and I swear every time I say the R word, there's another term that comes out in front of it. Yep. So give us a little bit of insight and then I'll backtrack around everybody. Um, I, I see it uh, becoming more ingrained in our, our lives. Um, you know, whether it's going to be contact lenses or eyeglasses or how, what have you, I know that it's going to be on a consumer level and become ubiquitous with our daily life, the way that the iPhone and the Android device has. Um, I think that it's, we're going to have uh, maybe peripherals to our smartphones that are going to uh, begin to interact with our environments. Uh, and I don't think it's going to be augmented in virtual realities anymore. I think it's going to merge into one. Um, and then we're going to have an opacity setting uh, so that you're like, oh, BRB, I'm going to go into like, you know, I can't see you mode, whatever we call that, uh, fully uh, encompassing ourselves into the environment and uh, including our real environment. Um, whatever we call that, it's the same. We're going to be uh, on a scale between digital and reality. We're going to be somewhere along that plane. So um, it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Fun and terrifying all at the same time. <laughs> Erin, what do you see going forward with esports? I mean, the the ramp to get it to where it is today has been swift. So, what are you forecasting? Well, first of all, I want some of those glasses that Karis was talking about. That's <laughs> anytime you need a prototype, let me know. That sounds awesome. I'm ready to turn these digital. Um, so, I think uh, the COVID-19 uh, situation has provided an incredible opportunity for esports um, in that we are learning to have distributed broadcasts. Uh, whereas once we needed to take, you know, massive trucks out, and you know, obviously we have our big stages, we move around, we have the live event experience. We love those experience, and and I think our fans really love that too. We really miss live events, um, but it has given us a really amazing opportunity to learn uh, to be completely on the cloud. So um, a lot of the technology that we're working on at Blizzard, uh, there was just an article that came out about the AMPP AMP system, uh, which is all cloud-based broadcasting technology that uh, we're developing um, in conjunction with a third-party partner over at Blizzard. So um, it's just really exciting to see how much technology is coming out of this uh, sort of time of necessity that we can't all be together, uh, but the show must go on. People 
people are looking for entertainment um, and sports. Uh, one of the th the coolest things that I think I've seen um, is the the Formula One racing and the NASCAR racing is that the drivers are actually getting these rigs at home and they're able to play remotely and it's actually being broadcast on major sports networks, uh, which is just so it's so cool. So uh, I just can't wait to see how much more we get to do with this, um, especially now that the spark has kind of been set. Uh, so I think esports, you know, we just have so many different ways and we can grow um, and it's not just tied to our live events anymore, which is really cool. Yeah, it certainly has put some pressure back on that community building, right? Which which can take place virtually. That's that's right. a part of it. Yep. Yep. Great. Like uh, what have what have you seen? What are you forecasting? Um, I'm picking it backing off of what uh, Carrie said earlier. I really think that there's going to be more than AR in five to 10 years, especially with the development of quantum computing. We'll finally find a use case for it and we can utilize all of that power for something. And of course, the rise of machine learning, <clears throat> um, robotics, it's, 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 such a, it's such a wonder what could happen in 10 years. And um, I can't imagine it's going to be nothing less than more than digital. Probably, you know, we can have robots doing everything for us or we can have um digital whatever in in the future yeah but okay before we move on to you andrew a quick question since you brought up robots quick survey does anybody have them in their offices like pre-covid do you have mobile robots moving around because i've been to a few offices where they exist and it's it's wild no okay. could not say <laughs> i could not admit or deny anything ea sports here in orlando has i mean their team's global right so they have these robots with screens on them and when somebody remotes into a meeting they just navigate themselves to the correct meeting room and sit themselves down and and i can only see that that is that is going to become ever more present <laughs> with our future andrea what's your what's you you looking at in the glass fall going forward yeah, I think I'm seeing a lot of trends that everyone else on the call is seeing. Um, I definitely think, you know, as we get more sophisticated with channels like AR and VR, like marketing will absolutely be there. <laughs> and I think we also have, you know, more work to do on the personalization side in marketing. Uh, but I think we'll start to see some other areas and other channels fade out. I don't think we'll be putting so much money into billboards and car wraps and kind of some of these older uh technologies that were really effective at the time that may not be so modern anymore so all of you mentioned elements of how it changed swiftly whether it was the technology or where the budgets are being allocated what do you think um how do you feel full sail prepared you to adapt to those changes i mean when you get into an industry like technology which is vast right it, it encompasses a variety of different things one of the things we know we like to prepare students with at Full Sail is being able to problem solve and be creative. What did you gather from your education at Full Sail that's helped you keep ahead of technology on your teams? Let's let's start with Karis. Yeah, um, I can say that what Full Sail did for me that I will always praise them for is they gave me um, the skills to learn something new, um, the ability to uh, problem solve like you said and the um not just how to use the tools but also the, the the principles on how to use the tools so that i could take those principles and apply them to any technology that uh would be you know invented thereafter um if you know if you have a good base of understanding of art and technology and how those things work together once you understand the different uh you know ways to work the pencil you're working with you can create something out of it um, so they, they taught us how to draw as a, you know, uh, uh, sorry about my analogy, how to draw and then your medium changes, you know, yeah. um, the skill stays consistent. So they, they taught me how to learn. Oh, that's great. Uh, Laika, what about you? I think the biggest thing is um, the ability to adapt since it's so fast fast paced so every month it just changes and you know <clears throat> even though you try, try to prepare for it for it there's just not enough time so it really taught me the the ability to adapt and move as fast as it 
that's where we're moving um, back then. But yeah, um, that, that's one of the major things in technology. If you can't move as fast as technology is moving, you're going to get left behind. And as well as, of course, networking, the emphasis on networking, <clears throat> you know, how heavy we emphasize on networking that also paved the way for me to, to get to where I am today. Oh, that's great. Andrew, what about you? Yeah, um, I'd say I came to full sail for looking for like a specific group of courses. I wanted to be able to graduate and hit the ground running. Uh, so my bachelor's is actually in computer science. And by the time I finished my degree in CS, I got already gone through three programming languages. Like my degree program was not able to keep up <laughs> with the work that I needed when I graduated. Uh, so when I decided to go to grad school, I was like, okay, I need hands-on training that I can use every day uh, so that I'll be up to speed. And if the industry changes and we have new channels that come available for marketing, like the coursework needs to align with that. Um, so I would say that's the, the best thing that I've learned is just how to watch trends, um, not to be afraid to dive in and being online, how to like form those really close relationships and networking with, with other people who may be far away. Great, Erin. Yeah, it was the speed, uh, being able to adapt very quickly and, and being forced through that gauntlet. <laughs> like, you know, that that is a trying time. And, uh, you know, I think the stress that it puts on you mentally um, actually really prepares you pretty well for a career because it never stops. You know, I mean, even if you're not quite feeling it that day, uh, you still will have stuff to do. People are counting on you for things. Uh, like I said, the show must go on. So, um, you know, I, I think perseverance and just the kind of time trial um, you got to get through it, I think was, was very helpful helpful discipline it it is and I you know to to echo that I I swear the training that I got at Full Sail on that perseverance that you mentioned Erin has helped me in life right like if you can't adapt to life you can I mean look at the circumstances that we're in now things flipped upside down and I really do feel like the interesting schedules that we get put on at Full Sail and and the the way that things shift really just help you accept quickly that this is going to happen. It's just part of your natural um, life path going forward. So let's look at um, being a female in the industry. Is there anything that you felt you came equipped as better to do your job as a female and, and any advice to women that are looking to get into these industries that, you know, don't think that this is a negative. It's actually a positive. It's something that an asset that you brought to the table. Um, so Laika, let's start with you. <clears throat> um, so with this one, I think I, I remember um, a story. It was, it was a conversation I had with a previous coworker of mine. <clears throat> um, we had a tech conference in Las Vegas and then while out, uh, we were talking about females in the industry and then he told me that because because at that time I was the only female one on our team so he he told me that you know I value you being here because females bring different perspectives when it comes to looking at situations <clears throat> and it's really important that that balance exists between male and female in, in, uh, in a situation just so you can look at the, the perspectives of each other and see things from a different uh, point of view so that that was uh, one thing that I thought was very cool. But yeah, if if uh, if people really want to get into this industry, they have to fight for themselves and learn how to speak up. Because in, in speaking up, that's when we get our voices heard. Really, in in everything that we do. Yeah, it's it's no longer just being present, right? It's being active in that moment. You don't need to be just in the room or in the Zoom, um, but but speaking up. Yep. Andrew, what, what about you? What, what did you bring to the table that was unique, perhaps that had to do with your personal background? Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> Grit. <laughs> um, without going to an online program like Full Sail, like there would have been no way I could could have gotten through my degree program. I'm a single mom. I have twin daughters. They were very small at the time. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, just having that vote of confidence from other people in my class, knowing that there were places, there were people I could reach out to if I got stuck. Um, it was very different from my computer science <laughs> degree program, which was all men and, you know, very, very intimidating, intimidating, lots of bullying. 
Um, so yeah, it was nice to feel like part of a community and part of a family. And I think I still have that grit today, I hope. <laughs> I'm so glad you were able to find family with Full Sail. I, I second that completely. Erin, what about you? Well, uh, this may not sound great, but this was 10 over 10 years ago. So uh, Full Sail has done uh, a lot in, in also helping to diversify their campus. Uh, but when I went there, it had an unfortunate nickname of being called Full Male. Uh, so <laughs> there were a lot of guys on campus. Uh, I was the only woman in my degree program. I was the first woman to graduate from my degree program. So, um, you know, I... I came from a place that uh, looked just like the industry did. And, but over, like I said, over the last 10 years, Full Sail has changed just like our industry has changed. And I think it's far more diverse looking now. Um, and I, 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 you know, I mean, I think that that's obviously a testament to more women graduating early, coming back, you know, sh doing things like this and encouraging other women to come into the programs. And I think that that, um, that, just, that just helps. Like 10 years is not really that long of a time, but look at all the great programs that are out there for women now uh, that didn't exist uh, even even when I was in school. So um, <laughs> trial by fire, I guess. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Awesome. Karis, what about you? Um, I think what's unique about um, maybe uh, my position in particular is there's a lot of client facing responsibility. Um, so I have to kind of juggle multiple, we spend multiple plates and doing different tasks. And some of those tasks are, you know, working in the code architecture and some of those tasks are communicating with the end user about the feature that we just developed. And one of the things that my, um, my boss told me once, he said, you know, you can uh, deep dive into the code and uh, you can come back up for air and speak to the client on a level that they can understand. And that um, flexibility of communication is something that it's not just me. I think that a lot of women have and uh, the ability to, um, do that is something I think is a strength of a lot of women that I see in the industry. Absolutely. I hope everyone is paying attention to that. I mean, there's so much truth in that, that, that we do bring some unique skills to the table. And, and while the past wasn't as wonderful to women, it's certainly changing because we're here, we're speaking our minds and we're bringing really some incredible ideas and innovations to our, to our world. So I've got one more question and then we're gonna skip over to our audience questions. Um, so this is kind of a fun one, quick answers. What's the, the most interesting trend you've seen so far that excites you? Erin, um, let's start with you. Oh man, I'm excited to bring all of the AR, VR, XR, cool interactive marketing to esports. Um, I think that this is uh, going to be amazing. Uh, there are already a ton of different companies that are out there uh, like experimenting with it already, and it just looks so freaking cool. Uh, so I cannot wait uh, for more uh, augmented reality stuff to come to esports, that viewing experience. Awesome. Karis, being in VR, what, do you, what are you looking at as one of the exciting trend? So oh, it's all pretty exciting. I think we can agree. And I obviously love everything that has been happening with VR and AR in regard to it, it, the fact that it's reaching into all facets of our lives. I think it's super cool. Um, what I'm personally excited about is AR VR being used as a tool, being used as a serious tool, not, no longer being viewed as a game, no longer being viewed as a toy, uh, but actually providing value to, um, to large enterprise projects. That's fantastic. Andrew, what about you? Yeah, so I work in cloud computing where we have a lot of trends happening all the time. Um, but I think the coolest thing I've seen is machine learning uh, and like natural language processing. You know, we started out with things like autocorrect and auto suggest in the search bar. And now we're seeing like automatic translations for Google Slides and like accessibility features uh, that we didn't have before thanks to machine learning. So I think we'll continue to grow there. That's great. Laika, what are you seeing? 100% agree with Andrea. It's machine learning. You know, it's, we, we're, we're going to make progress with self-driving cars and, and all of those things like automated glasses or something, the Google glasses that, that happened before it might be revived and make, make something better out of it. But um, yeah, I'm really, really excited about machine learning and the possibilities of it. Oh, that's fantastic. Awesome. All right, well, let's get to our questions. I've got one from Helen on Facebook. She is asking, how did you all land your first 
role in the industry. Erin, let's start with you. Well, um, I was very thankful that I uh, had, was a b part of a bit of an experiment at Full Sail, um, whereas we we, in we would normally go into final project, um, but uh, they had taken our class and, and tried some internships with us. So uh, mm -hmm. I got an internship at a local Orlando studio that was run uh, by a former Full Sail professor. And uh, my very first job was uh, as an associate producer uh, at ZG Games. So uh, mm -hmm. I got to actually get my first job while I was still in school, which I am incredibly, incredibly thankful for. So, uh, so that's kind of how I, I first started. It was actually part of my education experience. Um, but after that, you know, it was, it was that grind of, you know, applying and stuff, but having that first job under my belt was, was an enormous leg up. Well, that really showcases the power of that full sale network, you know, yes. keeping in touch and, and really even ushering an entire class into, to, into that. Andrew, what about you? How did you get started? Yeah, so I ended up um, taking a few free roles. So I did a lot of freelance work. Um, I think, I don't even remember what the platform is called. Odesk, Odesk, before they were acquired by Elance. Uh, that's where I started. I wanted to build a portfolio. I wanted to put together some creative pieces. Um, obviously I had no idea what I was doing, but I was looking at other examples <laughs> from other portfolios online. I did a lot of LinkedIn stalking. Uh, even LinkedIn was pretty new back then, um, but I wasn't afraid to ask questions <laughs> and just find other people in the field and say, hey, you know, am I doing this right? Am I on the right track? Um, and that is how I landed my first role. I came in with a full portfolio and recommendations and got the job. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I, I think it's such a critical element when you're young and you're starting out and you are uncertain maybe of if you're doing it right or not, there is nothing wrong with reaching out to people and just saying, hey, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm playing with. How does that work? And what's your perception? And really the worst thing that's gonna happen is they're not gonna respond, right? So it's it's okay. Karis, how about you? Uh, so um, I went to a bunch of different industry related events um, and rather than just like t-shirt cannoning my business card around, like. I had like a method I wanted to share. Um, I would go around to each one of the exhibitors and I would look at their product and I would try to imagine how I would improve their product. Um, and then I would get to know that person and I would talk to them and I would ask them what's going on, tell me about your thing, like, uh, you know, really employ my interpersonal communication skills that I learned at Full Sail. Um, and I just kept doing my rounds and tried to understand a little bit more about each of those exhibitors every time I went around. And by the end of um, one of the conventions I went to, um, I had a job and that was my first job in the industry. See, that's hustle. That's, that's <laughs> impressive. I like that. Yeah. Like, how'd you get started? Uh, networking. So um, every month at Full Sail, you'll have different sets of classmates because depending on um, if your program shifted from you're supposed to take the six month but the, it's the eight month courses that you're going to take this month so it, it's just change, it's just changing constantly so I network with like most of my classmates um, tried to help them as much as they helped me or, or you know just talk to them during class <clears throat> and after I graduated um, the program director actually Jay reached out to me and said hey there's a job opening for this company do you want to apply so I, I did apply and then I I found an old classmate that was working for that company and he referred me, which fed up the entire process. And that's how I got my first job. When, when you do enter, because I know you will after watching this, when you do enter the Full Sail family, you will be overwhelmed with the number of times you hear networking and it's a reality. I just want you to get used to it now. It's the way the world works. Um, communication skills are essential. They just are. And, and networking can be awkward, but it's okay. I mean, that's really how I got my start too. I had been working in, in New York for a while, but when I came to Full Sail, that was my first entrance into the Florida market in working. And I went to a networking event and waited, I think maybe 30 minutes to talk to the film commissioner. And it was worth it because that first introduction. She told me a few other people to meet in the room. She then watched to see if I actually followed her advice. And when I did, that was really the first impression that she was looking for. She later hired me 
and I now have her job with her blessing. We didn't kick her out. Um, and that evolved into to innovation, but networking is literally an essential quality that it doesn't matter how far advanced you are in your career. It's something essential to keeping it moving forward. Okay, we've got another question from Rebecca on Facebook. What techniques do you use to keep on track and motivated? Karis, let's start with you. This is, this is a very, very important topic for me. I think like a lot of um, creative professionals, we struggle with staying on task and focusing. Um, I've, uh, I think I'm kind of like a, like a, may, maybe a poster child for ADHD. I don't know. Maybe that's a thing I can do. So, um, but I've found that I can hyper-focus in a very positive way and keep myself, you know, my self-care intact enough to accomplish things that I didn't know that I could accomplish. So I think of like the, all that energy that I usually radiate, that's just like to my whole life, right? is just energy that I've had that if I take it and I focus it in one direction, I can do some really cool stuff. Um, so I use a number of techniques, uh, make sure that I'm taken care of first and foremost, am I eating right, am I sleeping well, that kind of thing, I'm doing my exercise and everything. If, I, if my stem bars get uh, disproportionate to one another, I will make sure my stem bar goes back up before continuing, um, and make sure, making sure that's a priority. Uh, uh, keeping a creative space is really important. Um, it takes a certain amount of time to get into your creative flow state and you need to keep that special and keep that important to your, yourself. So um, uh, remember that you are just a machine and you have to kind of like tinker with the different dials in order to get yourself to work correctly. Um, and then if all else fails, I enjoy the Pomodoro technique. If you're really not into it that day, take a break, come back, take a break, come back. Um, and you will find that you're more productive that way than just staring at it and just like hoping it'll work this time. Um, Cause uh, your brain is really a unique organism and uh, you can sometimes trick it to do the thing you want to do. Isn't that the truth? Awesome, that was great. Laika, what about you? How do you stay on track? <clears throat> so I think motivation, at least for me, is a very personal thing. Like each person has a different way of motivating themselves. For me, it's mostly reminding myself that I'm afraid to fail and I'm not yet the best is what keeps me going. <clears throat> Every day when I get sidetracked or anything, I remind myself, hey, you're not yet the best. You're not yet the greatest. You're going to fail. And uh, the moment I remind myself, it just kicks me back up and say, okay, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to learn. I'm ready. I'm ready to be the best kind of thing. But yeah, that, that's how I get motivated. Love it. Awesome. Andrea. Yeah, I am definitely one of those people who gets bored easily. So I would say I am just starting to figure out the, the secret sauce to staying motivated. Uh, but I will challenge myself some ways, sometimes in really, really silly ways. Sometimes I'll have a task that I don't want to do. And I'll just say, can I do this task before my ice cream melts? <laughs> yes, I'm going to do it. <laughs> like, it's kind of like self-bribery, but uh, it works. It works. Um, I've also found that working in sprints is really good for me for some reason. Um, I don't like context switching between 1,500 different tasks all day. Uh, so if I can block off time and say, okay, at the beginning of the week, I'm like, these are the three things that I'm accomplishing by the end of this week. Uh, and I just focus. And so I know Luis and everyone from Full Sail has been in my inbox for this event and they are not getting responses because I'm in a sprint right now uh, for, to get dollars for COVID-19 research for our researchers. So I think having that focus, uh, it really helps me get things done. Oh, thank you. That's, that's great. Erin. Uh, I'm a big list maker. Um, I, I, so I make a list of what I absolutely must accomplish that day. Um, and I make a list of what could slip if I really wasn't feeling it. Uh, so I give myself an out uh, if I, if I really don't feel like I want to work on that thing that day. Uh, the other trick that I do is that I, I hold myself accountable by telling other people I will be delivering things on certain days. So if I know for a fact, like, I, okay, I have to get this done. I've been putting it off. I really don't want to do it. I'm going to tell my manager I'll have it delivered by that day so that I absolutely must have it done. So, um, cause I hate letting people down. So <laughs> I just force that kind of <laughs> carrot and stick, uh, in my brain. And, you know, I'm like, okay, okay. I don't want to let them down. I told them I would have it done tomorrow. I got to have it done tomorrow. So, uh, I usually force myself into it. Too. <laughs> 
I mean, whatever works, right? I mean, that's <laughs> for us. We all have really different styles, and and I think sharing that and asking that with your friends, your family, people around you, it, that is such a good question to ask. Thank you, um, Rebecca. So um, next question, Delaney on Facebook. Andrea, this is to you. What is the interview process for getting a job at Google? I'm in digital design and it's a place I would like to intern for or get a job at. Yeah, so getting a job at Google is pretty much just like getting a job anywhere else. Um, we definitely have a job board uh, and a referral program. So if you know someone at Google, please reach out. Um, but yeah, our recruiters are like work tirelessly um, for diversity and inclusion. And it's one of our company OKRs and they have like diversity numbers that they have to hit uh, every single quarter. So yeah, if you are looking to find a job there, please apply and come on board. Awesome. Real quick, just in case we've got some newbies who haven't heard that term, can you share OKR? Oh yeah, it's a key result. So it's kind of like, you know, the big goals, the big goals that your company has. And we have personal OKRs too. And yeah. Great. All right. Quentin has a question on Facebook for Leica. If I want to work as a cloud engineer after graduating, what specific things should I be focusing on over the next few months before graduating to secure a cloud engineering job? <laughs> Yes, so that would vary um, greatly if you want to be a specialized cloud engineer or if you want to be a generalized generalized cloud engineer. So if you want to be a specialized cloud engineer, you have to pick a domain, either big data, machine learning, and <clears throat> um, internet of things. There's just so many out there. And if you want to be a generalist, then you have to know um, you know, your core technologies, Linux, Windows, Bash, you know, all those scripting skills. Um, most of what they teach at Full Sail is actually the core skills that we need in order to get a job as a cloud engineer. Believe it or not, there is some stuff that they teach there <clears throat> that when I got into the field and started working, only Full Sail students knew how to use that specific technology and we had to train the rest to, to do it. So if you pay attention in school, you know, just, just do your uh, coursework and just listen ask questions from your teachers, then you can secure a cloud technology job in, in the future. <clears throat> I love that. All right, next question. Helen on Facebook wants to know, what area of your professional career have you seen or want to see the most growth? Erin, let's start with you. Well, personally, so I'm at the phase now of my career uh, that I'm starting to get into uh, management and helping other people with their careers. Um, and that has been um, a challenge. It's been a challenge to break my brain out of wanting to be an individual contributor um, now to empowering other individual contributors to to kind of maximize their potential. Um, and so, you know, my days look different now. You know, I don't work as much hands on on the product. Um, I am not, you know, uh, you know, I'm not doing as much uh, that would directly contribute to furthering along our sort of team goals. Um, I'm more now looking at big picture stuff, helping people with, you know, what's your trajectory? Where do you want to be in five years? You know, what skills are you missing? Um, you know, how do we shore those up and get you in an area that you're really excited? Um, we're really lucky that Blizzard takes career development uh, very, very seriously there. Um, in fact, they are so serious about it that they actually encourage you to, to cross apply to other teams uh, within the company. There's a lot of internal mobility. So if you have had a couple years on one project and you want to go and, you know, go work on some completely different technology, maybe you want to go work on incubation, something that's completely different outside of your comfort zone, uh, you can go do that. So a lot of what I do now is kind of helping people find their place and, and, you know, bringing people in. We do a lot of hiring and stuff. So my career looks very, my current job looks very different now than it did even a couple years ago. Thank you for sharing all of that. Laika, what about you? What what part of your career have you seen or want to see growth? Um, so I graduated full sale 2017, May 2017. So I think and I consider myself still a freshie in the industry. Like I have so much to learn in terms of either specialization or even just the technologies that we're using every day. 
I think that I'm not uh, up to the standard yet of people with like five, six years of experience just because I'm still learning the ropes. <clears throat> so I really want to see that grow in the future and as well as develop, you know, managerial skills and all that so I can um, move my skill, uh, my, my, my uh, profession, professional career to the trajectory I wanted to go. Oh, fantastic. Andrea, what about you? Yeah, I would say um, I've definitely been in marketing a long time, <laughs> but uh, I finally feel like I'm at the point where mentorship is actually important to me. Um, so finding new mentors, people reach out on me on, on LinkedIn, which is amazing. Uh, and yeah, helping other people find those opportunities. And I think the biggest thing that I see with mentors time and time again, people don't really think about the value that they are bringing. You know, we always hear, know your worth, know your worth, but you know, it's different being able to say, oh, well, I'm a great marketer because I did this one campaign that was great and being able to say, oh, I'm a marketer. This was my campaign. This is my conversion rate. And I brought in 5 billion in pipeline. Like there's a way to quantify your experience so that, you know, you put the best foot forward. And I think that's something I've seen women struggle with in particular, like over and over again. Awesome. Harris? So I think I, I need to mention my growth from artist to programmer with this question. Um, so when I graduated Full Sail, uh, I was you know game art, I was an artist, um, 3D modeler, I did character modeling. Um, and, uh, you know, I could, give details along that path, but the, the short of it is that um, over the, the last seven years, I've grown from just an artist to an artist and a game designer to a game designer who also can develop and program her own features to a virtual reality developer that can design, plan, initiate, uh, flesh out, and you know develop her own features that she then markets and deploys to the you know, everybody. And like, it's, it's been like, okay, well, if I can do that, what else can I do kind of thing? Um, and I've pushed myself so far. I think at this point in my career, I'm really taking a look back at myself as an artist. And it sounds kind of cheesy, um, but I'm like, you know what? I'm an artist and that's okay. And I, I, I should, I, I'm gonna, you know, sink my teeth back into what I really love about this industry and like getting back into all the exciting things about, um, you know, what we can do now with how many triangles we can, we can fit into a box. Um, and um, I'm really enjoying that, my personal path. So if there's any, uh, any young ladies or anybody at all who's listening who thinks that they can't program, I didn't think I could either. So. Isn't that the truth? I mean, I, I think most of us in this field, and, and I think if you're the type of person who's attracted to Full Sail, your career is going to take some turns that will surprise you. And I think especially something that I found is that I was prepared, you know, as all those things that we talked about earlier and, and how Full Sail prepared us to adapt, that has been amazing. I mean, I started in film, as I was talking about earlier, and now I'm in innovation and technology, and there are intersections. There are these opportunities to make the jumps into different fields. And I think as long as you keep an open mind and perspective and a close network of people to support you, you absolutely can make it happen. All right, we've got another question. How are you and the companies that you are working for adapting to working remotely? So show of hands, was anybody working remotely before COVID? Okay, Leica and Andrea. So Karis and Erin, this was new. How, how did that work? Karis, let's start with you. So small caveat, I, since we were an international firm, uh, we do uh, video calls to interact with the other offices, including um, uh, my upper management. Um, but you know, we still had to commute to the office every day. We work in downtown Orlando. And uh, that office environment was very important to us as a firm. Um, so uh, making the change from uh, office every day to home every day, it was, it was different, but honestly, um, from my own perspective, I think that it was beneficial because, um, again, with that whole like creative state thing, uh, I was able to take control of, of my own um, flow state and be able to be a lot more productive um, and a lot happier. I was able to focus more on self-care and also meet all my deadlines and, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So um, I think that it, 
it's been an adjustment, but the firm as a whole has been doing very well. Great. And Aaron, you started to touch on this earlier of, you know, you were in live events. It's very tactile. Taking that fully remote, how has how's that worked? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> a lot of our lives have changed quite a bit. Um, I, I, we were just talking before we, we we started talking publicly here that we uh, I, I got back from Hall of Fame and literally started working from home the the next week. So uh, I haven't been back to the office, you know, even before I went to full sale. So uh, so it's been a while. It's been a big adjustment, I think, for us. Um, Blizzard is very much a in-person collaborative. You are there if you are sick or you can't come to work like you shouldn't work from home. You know, there's exceptions, of course, but like they want you to to focus on yourself when you're home and like focus on work when you're at work. So it's very much, you know, be in the office, be together. Um, you know, a lot of our, I, I've talked to a couple of people, especially artists who are really struggling. Um, they miss that collaborative environment where they can bounce ideas off of each other. Um, I miss my teammates. I miss seeing them. Um, and so I, I'm also a big people person. And as a project manager, my time is spent with other people working out problems together. So it's been definitely a big adjustment. I think on the technology side, um, you know, kind of how I, talked about earlier you know our technology is advancing very quickly we have uh taken uh you know some some lemons and made some really cool lemonade with it um and so you know overwatch league is still broadcasting call of duty is still broadcasting hearthstone world of warcraft everybody's still broadcasting um with relatively little downtime so um our teams our broadcast team are just all amazing rock stars they were just able to kind of come together and just come up with these really interesting uh you know, ways to do broadcast. So we miss live events. I miss the players. I miss going to, and traveling. I was supposed to be in Bali, Indonesia this year. I was supposed to be in Madrid later, all these places I want to go to. Uh, so this year has changed quite a bit for us. But um, so far, I'm actually really enjoying the the work from home. The company has been extremely supportive. Um, Bobby Kotick himself showed up on one of our calls to just kind of reiterate, um, you know, how he's supporting everybody. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of Activision Blizzard. I think that they've done, done a really fantastic job. Great. Andrea, so you had more experience working from home. What's some advice for somebody who hasn't had to experience that yet? Yeah, don't expect perfection. So <laughs> we actually had an event uh, earlier this week. We are in a ukulele jam. I play ukulele. My daughters play ukuleles. Um, it's becoming a problem. We have a lot of ukuleles, <laughs> but um, we have a Google Uke Jam and normally they are based out of uh, our MTV offices in San Bruno. So they're in the South Bay. So I never get to play with them, but because of um, everyone being at home and sheltering in place, like this week I got to jam with them. But was it the most amazing jam where everyone is in tune and there's no lag and... <laughs> No, it wasn't that at all, um, but we knew that going in and, and it was great. It was great to be able to see people and connect with them, you know, with a hobby that you have in common that you don't usually see. Um, but it was also nice to not have that expectation of like, okay, this is going to be our track that we're creating out to the world and it's going to be phenomenal. Like, no, we all knew it was going to be a little rough around the edges. <laughs> but you showed up and that's, that's what counts. Laika, what advice do you have to offer for folks that are, are making this transition or entering into the workforce and, and going to be ha having to work from home for the first time? So the number one thing to remember about working from home is communication is a lot harder than if you are in office. Because if you are in office, you can just go and tap somebody and ask your question or whatever. But if you're working from home, it's, you know, you have to either wait for somebody to respond or <clears throat> look for resources by pinging almost a lot of people just to find that one person that can answer your question. But yeah, so, so that's the one key thing to remember. Um, the other thing is that uh, it's a little hard at times because you can get derailed. Like I didn't realize how much more distractions I have at home than in office. Because <clears throat> sometimes, you know, you'll be tempted to watch Netflix or something and then you'll forget that you're working like every hour just to go on a walk or do something that you really like just so you wouldn't get bored and you don't want to tear your head off for <clears throat> just working from home and not talking to somebody you're not seeing somebody in person but yeah <laughs> oh, that's great all right we've got some more questions that came in 
Joel wants to know what can educators do to encourage young females to get interested in STEM or STEAM classes? Um, Karis. Oh boy. Um, you know, I, I think that it's important to relate these kinds of industries to things that they're already interested in, uh, depending on the age group of the, the person that you're, you're teaching. Um, you know, if as an educator, you would be uh, showing them, hey, you, you would be able to accomplish these things with this particular thing you like if you use Python or like if you use this or like finding um, a, a way to guide the person into that. So um, I, 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 there is a, a toy company that uses a method um, that I'm trying to draw from, but um, uh, Goldie Blocks, I think. And the Goldie Blocks it creates STEM t uh, toys for young uh, young girls and they use um, like simple machines and and like Lego block style building mechanisms to create stories and and they use the story based uh, teaching method to get the the young girl to understand and be interested in the uh, simple machine kind of thing that they're learning so that kind of applied story based learning I think can can be kind of uh, applied on a number of different things. Yeah, so helping, kind of helping them understand the different applications, that there's a disconnect of, okay, so here's this word STEM or STEAM, but mm -hmm. here's the things you actually get to do and play with in a career setting. Yeah. Andrew, you've got little ones. What What do you think? Yeah, um, I love Goldie Blocks, by the way. <laughs> I remember when they launched, I was like, this is the cutest thing ever. Uh, but yeah, we definitely use Tinker and like a few other um, learning platforms, but I think the most important thing maybe for lifelong learning is just fostering that sense of curiosity, right? So we use tons of apps. My girls have grown up in this like, software heavy environment, um, but we will just look at an app or look at a weather forecast and say, well, how? You know, I just ask them questions like, how do you think that works? Where do you think that data comes from? Like, how do you think that data is collected? Or what is this app actually doing? <laughs> you know? So yeah. um, I think asking those questions so that they actually like pay attention to the world around them and started to notice little, little things and how systems work and um, how they work together is, is probably most important. Right. Laika, how did you know you wanted to get involved in STEM and is there any advice you can give here? Hey, so um, when I was in high school, I went to an all girls high school and we're always asked or we always have this event every year where we have to dress up for the career that we want to pursue when we grow up. <clears throat> and I noticed that 90% of the girls in my school dressed up as either doctors, nurses, teachers, bank accountants or whatever. Nobody dressed up or nobody wanted to be in the tech field. Nobody wanted to be a software engineer. Nobody wanted to be in IT. <clears throat> Just nobody. <laughs> so I asked, um, I, I ran a survey um, when I graduated in college and I had to go back home. I ran a survey when I went back to that all school to give a talk and said, why don't you guys want to pursue tech? <clears throat> and the number one answer I got was that it's a career or it's a field for men, not for women. Like it's, it's a major, major thing that we have to address and constantly assure the young girls that, hey, females can excel in tech too. I think that's the number one thing. And the second is that, um, so with that, with, when I learned that, I, I, I tried to do like a six week workshop where I gave them like raspberry pies, um, Roblox and all that, and then just gave them hands on activities and mm -hmm. showed them the possibility of the things they can do. And then after that one, I re-ran the survey. So how many wants to pursue tech? And I got like 30% converting into tech because they found it so cool. And they found that they were able to do it as well. So yeah. that's the one thing. <clears throat> if you can instill that in, in a girl's mind, in a little kid's mind that, hey, you can do this too. It is possible for you too. Then there's a possibility that they would consider switching into tech. Awesome. Karen, what do you add, have to add here? Oh, I completely agree. Like you have to normalize it. It has to be a normal thing. Like it can't feel like this. Oh, well, you really have to work so hard to beat all the boys to get into the industry. It's like, that's, that's not, that's not at all how it is. You have to be, you know, normalize it. Having a nerdy mom who's super into all these, you know, awesome apps and this technology, like 
you know, being an aunt or, you know, any kind of role model for younger kids, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, techie yourself, you know, that's, that's, that can sometimes make an enormous difference. Um, I think it's also really important for people to see uh, women who are doing these roles, who are actually working in the industry and talking. So events like this are really uh, great. Um, I'm doing a, uh, a career day for fourth graders next week. Uh, they're doing it over Zoom and they want to hear all about esports. And so, um, you know, I think it's really important for young kids to see oh yeah women actually work in esports and video games something that's like for boys um so i think that you know you just have to constantly continue to, to break those stigmas and and just normalize uh you know the presence of women in these spaces absolutely because it's i think it's daunting to think about all these different media and, and all these different elements that we interact with and sometimes people just don't understand those are actual careers that you can get into and follow these steps and you can join into that. So we've got another question from Delaney on Facebook. What is your general advice for good first steps to take directly after graduating? Erin, let's go back to you. Um, yeah, so start talking to people. I mean, you're going to hear it again. Networking is coming, everyone. But, um, you know, t start talking to people before you even graduate. Um, there are a lot of people out there who are actually very eager, a lot of grads who are eager to talk to you while you're still in school. Um, it makes it a lot easier if you start to build those relationships early on. Um, and then, yeah, just start reaching out to people um, and, and asking them about their careers, about, you know, what they're, what they're interested in. Start to make friends. Um, and you're going to start to find that it's a lot easier, especially when it comes time to start applying for roles. If you do have referrals, um, I'm going to tell you it's an unfortunate reality, but referrals will, will oftentimes take the positions that you're looking for. So, um, you know, we get, we had a project manager position, had 300 plus applicants on it um, and, uh, and a referral uh, ended up getting it. So, you know, it, it, it really helps to know somebody um, and somebody who actually has some familiarity with you, not just a cold call. Hey, can you put my name in for a job? Like, I'm not going to do that because I don't know you. But if we've had a relationship for the last year and we've been talking, uh, that's a whole different story. And that's the significance of showing up and being active in these networking events that you get the opportunity to build relationships, even if it's five minutes at a time. Yeah. You be present. Go out of your way. Yeah. You know. Karis, what about you? So I would say um, to get a job, um, it's important that you don't have any gaps in your employment history. Uh, even if it's not your dream job, it's so much harder to get in without a job. If that makes any sense. It doesn't even matter what kind of job it is. And a job will make it easier to transition into the job that you want or the job that you kind of are close to wanting. Uh, then going from nothing to dream job. It's just, not, it just doesn't happen. Um, you have to have proper expectations and you have to remember to take care of your finances. Um, if you are taken care of, then you can start, you know, studying on the side and, and doing the networking events and like going to the conventions and doing whatever you need to do to get you where you want to go. If you stay focused, you'll get there. It doesn't matter what job you have. I love that because there's so many different skill sets that you can pick up on, even when it's not your dream job. If you just keep that mindset of, I'm going to keep going forward, working towards my goal. What can I take out of this in-between job? Andrea, what about you? First steps after graduating. Yeah, one thing that was really helpful to me after graduating was joining professional associations. Um, so I didn't know a lot of people in my town then. And after that, I moved to San Francisco where we knew no one because I moved here sight unseen. Uh, but my professional organizations actually helped me a lot because I was able to find not only workshops and training, um, but I was able to find volunteer opportunities as well. And I think volunteer opportunities are such a great way to meet other people who are like-minded who are in your field. Um, so that really, really helped me, especially being in a new, a new city. Absolutely. And, I, and to tie it back to what Aaron said, those volunteer opportunities often will get you with a decision maker who doesn't have capacity for some of these things. But that, that first impression of showing up and doing some volunteer work will go a long way. And they will certainly remember you because you help them out in a jam. Like a first steps after graduation. So the key thing to remember when applying for jobs, going back to that one, is don't have a general resume. Just just don't. Pick like 
four, three or four things that you want to pursue, like the job titles that you want to pursue, and then create a resume for each one of those jobs. <clears throat> like a general resume, for, for example, if you want to be a cloud engineer, a general resume for a cloud engineer, a general resume for a consultant, and a general resume for a systems engineer, and then edit it based on the job description that you see online before even clicking to apply. <clears throat> that way, um, you can pattern your resume to the job that you're applying for. It, it's easier to apply with that, and it's easier to get the job in that method rather than sending one general resume just for almost everything that you can think of. And also, if you're an international student, make sure to contact your DSO about the possibilities of you working and staying here. So remember that. I, I'm so glad you answered that. I mean, at the Economic Partnership here in Orlando, we are looking at skill-based hiring as an emerging trend, especially in the state of where we're at with so much unemployment across our nation. Skill-based hiring is going to make a difference. It's not necessarily that you graduated with a specific degree, but what projects have you worked on and what skills did you glean from those activities? And that can translate in a really valuable way. So thank you for sharing that. Everyone, this has been fantastic. I know I've already learned a lot. I hope everyone watching at home was able to learn a lot. Erin, Laika, Andrea, Karis, Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day today to share some advice. This is wonderful. If anyone has any questions, I'm sure you can find us all online in some way, shape, or form. LinkedIn. Oh, I'm on LinkedIn. It's my go-to. Um, so thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you around soon. Have a great day, everybody.